Is a little alcohol or wine okay for our health? Well, interesting thing is uh, the the evidence-based information up to date is saying no. Um, there's really no nutritional benefits of having alcohol, although alcohol has been consumed for you know centuries and thousands of years. I mean, you know, early form of beverage was an alcoholic beverage in almost every culture, and we use it for celebrations and other things like that. But what the most recent studies are looking at is, and, and there's still a, a big um, push from you know obviously alcohol lobby groups and the industries, and you know every celebrity selling their own beverage because it you know, makes a lot of money, but there's really true no nutritional benefit or health benefit for drinking. You know, there used to be the whole kind of wine paradox or you know, people used to be like, well, let's have a little bit of glass of wine maybe for the reserve at all in there. But really when you uh, like w- went to the fine uh, data uh, points of the study, you had to drink like 40 cases of wine to get the benefits of the reserve at all. So, you know, everybody wants to have some kind of benefit because, you know, that's how you sell a product. Uh, but let, you know, what, what I always tell my patients is that, you know, we're trying to limit the amount of alcohol consumption in general. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't have something for a celebration or a birthday or holiday or something like that. But uh, what the problem is, you know, with, with where we've seen uh, in the standard American diet and lifestyle is that there's a slippery slope. When we said, you know, you know, drink in moderation, that's what the bottom of every commercial is. But we see the, the highest amount of, you know, one of the uh, causes of uh, health conditions related to not just the diet, but is alcohol related events. You know, we talk about drunk driving, we talk about, you know, other cardiovascular and, and you know, uh, pancreatitis and liver problems. And so, you know, it's not a, that I'm anti-alcohol, but I, the, what happens with my patients is as we get healthier over time is that we just tend to not want to consume alcohol, right? Because like, it's kind of like the cleaner your machine. Like once you become, you know, once you go from a Ford to a Ferrari, you don't really seem to, you know, you want to keep running the machine and then running like a fine-tuned engine. So that's my perception, you know, I, but I'm not, you know, a dictatorial. But what I also want to look at is when patients do drink alcohol, you know, there's a limitation, you know, when we're talking about drinking uh, 1.5 ounces of hard alcohol, five ounces of for wine and, and 12 ounces for beer. But the average person actually consumes more than that. So we know they have beers or pitchers of beer or glasses of wine. Uh, you know, same thing with even when we talk about soda. So, you know, someone say a glass is, you know, I have a soda a day. And some people can have a big gulp, which is 64 ounces, still considering one, right? So, uh, you know, when the study came out on wine, you know, like all of Na- it was like two years ago, Napa Valley wines all containing uh, glyphosate. Right. So we're looking at other toxins, not just the alcohol, but, you know, let's grapes. Well, grapes are one of the heavily, heavily sprayed uh, foods. So sprayed with glyphosate, which is, you know, which is a um, herbicide pesticide by Monsanto or now it's generic. So these are things that we are now uh, contributing to more gluten problems, more uh, gut problems and more, more allergy problems. So like looking, you know, if you are, I tell people, if you are drinking alcohol, try to get organic, try to get a cleaner form. Don't buy cheap alcohol. Don't buy $2 alcohol. You know, that could probably run your car. So I always look at, you know, try to make it better, at least cleaner is, you know, but cleaner doesn't mean healthier, just means it's cleaner. So I don't want to be like, that's an excuse. Like I, I'm drinking the finest tequila all day long and that's still good for me. No, it's better than probably cheap tequila because at least you're getting something real. However, uh, in my, my overall recommendation is trying to limit uh, to minimal to none and only for special occasions. Which of these alternative treatments get the best results and which haven't gotten you the results you wanted? homeopathy, acupuncture, herbal medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, physiological regulating medicine, plant-based diets, chiropractic care, fasting, and other non-traditional treatments? Well, that's an interesting question because we get uh, good results with all of them, but it's really the the approach and the experience of the practitioner and their knowledge, right? So can we say there's a lot of failures in a lot of those things? Yes, just like conventional medicine. It all depends on who's driving the car, right? So you want someone who's very experienced. So being an integrative physician, I am and with over 22 years now in practice, uh, and you know, with a variety of training all over the from, you know, Ayurvedic to Chinese medicine, acupuncture to herbal medicine, plant based diets, you know, an integrative fellowship trained, uh, you know, 20 years ago, with Dr. Andrew Weil in the program of integrative medicine that we're looking at now is like true detail of, of the delivery of uh, the clinician's experience. So um, plant-based diets, number one, like you have to do a plant-based diet. That's what the data shows. That's what all the recommendations are. So there's really, it's really no more debate. Uh, and in fact, you know, when I give the lecture on the, on the, in, in this conference, by the time I give the lecture at the end of the week, you know, but if you don't, if you don't understand that you're supposed to be eating plant-based, then, you know, you haven't been paying attention for the whole week of, of all these, you know, wonderful speakers that are going to be there. But from my perspective, you know, there is limitations because a lot of times, for example, chiropractic care, I find is not really doing chiropractic in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. They're not really doing hands-on 
hands-on, uh, you know, manipulation. They're really doing uh, what I what I see in my state is like, you know, it's like you know, you pay a fee, you go in, you get treatment. And I have patients who are like five, seven years, ten years going to the chiropractor every two weeks for back pain, but it's never like, are we healing the back pain? Are we looking at the underlying causes of that? So is it is it maybe safer or better than getting steroid injections? Sure. Is a patient actually getting better clinically? temporarily. Are they healing themselves? Not necessarily. And are people just kind of giving you know, fancy machines where they can bill insurance or, or some subpar supplements? I see that all over the place. Uh, when it's the same thing when it comes to homeopathy or same, same thing comes with herbal products, is it has to come from the experience of the clinician and understanding potency, purity, safety, and efficacy of what we deliver. And are we following clinical studies and are we looking at you know herbal medicine? Do they have a practice of that? Because everybody on the internet seems to be some kind of expert of everything. So uh, that question I like to say is that you know in, in the hands of uh, uh, experienced clinical, you know, integrative physician, we have a- excellent outcomes because it's understanding how to pick the best of a little bit of all of these and fine tune it rather than saying like dictatorial, like, well, this is just Ayurvedic medicine. This is Chinese medicine. This is just diet only. And that's where, you know, right now there's lifestyle medicine where there's just plant-based doctors and that's all they do. But then they also then just prescribe conventional medicines. They don't do herbal medicines or, or natural products, you know, and then there's other people who just do, you know, natural medicines and they don't talk about diet or so we, when we have this integrative approach, it actually improves the outcome of our patient because we have more to choose from and we're able to fine tune based on the history and physical and the lab results of the patient, which of those modalities would fit best for them to have a better outcome. What is the state of American health? Uh, we are in an inflammation nation, right? That's the book right there. Uh, you know, I've been speaking about this for about 20 years now. Uh, I wrote a book called An Inflammation Nation in you know, 2016. I was lucky to be invited to come speak last year at this Real Truth Health, about health Conference. And, uh, you know, just as I left, you know, everything happened, right? COVID happened. And so now the understanding of inflammation is even more important because I think now the average person around the United States and the world um, has heard this world of inflammation from a different perspective, from a viral uh, insult, from a viral infection that is called a multitude of, of uh, inflammatory responses in the body. And now we're even not only just acutely, but now we're having 30% of what we call long hauler or COVID uh, syndrome sent patients, which have, you know, neuropathies and in, in, in brain fog or, you know, memory cognition functions, chronic fatigue functions, you know, joint issues, gut issues, respiratory issues that again are not life threatening anymore, but they're chronic disabilities. So understanding inflammation is key. And that's, that, that's, <laughs> that's important. And so now uh, I think coming back and speaking and, and, and kind of bringing the perspective of what do we really need to do now? Because, you know, when, when it wasn't a crisis, people were just worried about heart disease and diabetes and cancer, which we all should be worried about, right? The most common, you know, 10 commons of uh, common causes of death we should be focused on. However, now, you know, when something comes out of left field and then it starts kind of evening out the whole board, young and old, and, and even now with the variants, we're seeing a whole new slew of a different demographic, which is now, you know, under 30. And this morning, I just read a case of a nine-year-old who's not in the ICU locally. So there's, there's, a, there's an issue where we used to think like, okay, maybe heart disease is this age, or maybe Alzheimer's is this age, maybe cancer is this age. I don't have to worry about anything. And now we have to look at, you have to keep your inflammation under control. You need to lower it. You need to have a, an anti-inflammatory diet. And you need to be proactive at taking things that would keep your inflammation down, like bosmeric and keeping your immune system up, like you know vitamin D and glucan 300, which we carry. And there's a variety of other things of how we understand like stress reduction. You know, in my book, I talk about all the, you know, 10 steps. These are the epigenetic steps that you need to take that are evidence-based that shows your diet, lifestyle, environment, and belief system are important. And if you balance those things out, which will keep the inflammation down and keep your immune system strong, keep your microbiome in balance, and we're checking food sensitivities and microbiome and nutritional deficiencies and eat right and have stress reduction, yoga, and meditation, all these things, you, you, you have a, a great resilience to disease. The problem is, you know, the average American is not that and they're having issues. And so we have to be very careful on... Um, on that, that aspect of just not, not providing uh, the in- adequate information of how to lower the inflammation. So um, America's in a really poor state of health. And I think now is the time for people to really start picking up you know, the book and saying, hey, what can I do to prevent myself? Because vaccinate, being vaccinated is great. You know, they should get vaccinated. However, you know, not, not all the vaccine is 100%. And that doesn't mean that you still may not be an outlier that has still problems after you get vaccinated. So we still wanna look at not only just COVID issues, but we wanna look at, well, 
in, in the midst of looking at getting healthier to lower, say, COVID risk, are they still lowering the risk of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's disease? So from our perspective, if you do the good foundation of health, then that improves and lowers the risk for all diseases upcoming. What alternatives are there to antibiotics? How, excuse me, how do you know when to use them and when to use a real antibiotic? So that's, again, in the hands of an experienced clinician. And this is the danger, I think, with the internet right now uh, and just the availability to go buy anything or take anything and just, you know, get sold products. Uh, in our in our practice, for example, you know, based on the patient's condition, based on their age, based on their comorbidities, which is important, right? Uh, looking at whether they have diabetes or hypertension, or whether they've had that illness before, whether they have low immune system functioning, autoimmune disease, for example, um, also allergies and sensitivities. Like some people might have allergies to certain antibiotics, and sometimes we're limited because certain drugs are resistant right now in the population. So we look at. From our perspective, there is certain uh, natural antibiotics that we can give very successfully. We can give, you know, and there's herbal products, uh, and but then certain herbal products have specific specificities on the types of infection that they're more well known and documented in the clinical literature at having antimicrobial effects. So, for example, certain herbs have better upper respiratory, certain herbs have more lower urinary tract, some of them are more broad spectrum, uh, some of them are more for gut dysfunction or dysbiosis or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So there's a little bit of misunderstanding because people will say, well, this is anti antimicrobial, let me just take this herb, and that's not really focused on where they need to go. Second problem that we see is in the, in the marketplace is that potent and purity safety efficacy is not there. So a lot of people might have the right category. Even some of the practitioners might have the right category, but if they're not trained in herbal medicine to understand like maybe that dose in the bottle actually needs to be five times the dose of the potency to actually have physical effect. So a lot of people like to take small doses because this is how the you know, manufacturers, they, they, they gather the data and they kind of micro dose it so they can make maximum profits, but then we're not getting the clinical benefits, right? And then people fail that therapy and then they have to take antibiotics. If you give the right natural therapy, about 90% of the time, if you can get it within the first three days, you may not need to have an antibiotic. Okay. We also use like broad spectrum antimicrobials. And one of them is what we call is coated silver. Uh, it's a patented form. Now, interesting thing, people will say, well, what about like colloidal silvers? And how I've been using that. Well, there's a, a study that just came out. It's recently published. Uh, it's on PubMed and it's the comparative an analysis of a commercially prepared colloidal silver products. They took 14 of the most common colloidal silver products that you see on Amazon, right? Amazon, the largest retail in the world. Those 14, most people in America, if I went from Kansas to New York City to Chicago, Florida to Texas to Albuquerque, I, you, know, you can show them their brand and they'll say, I've taken it or I've seen it on the sh store in my local shop, in a, in a fancy, uh, fancy health food store or a big box store, right? It's everywhere. And out of the 14, 12 of them failed. Right, they were non nanoparticle as they proclaimed, and they were ionic silvers and not colloidal, which means that they actually are causing more dysfunction. And the data goes through that saying that these are not as safe as they proclaim. And so we have to be really, really careful. So when we when we do offer uh, a, a broad spectrum, it's like, well, which one? We're very specific. What patent? You know, what what potency? And is there safety studies? So when we look at something that's broad spectrum for antivirals, for example, um, it can be very, very helpful. But again, a lot of people get misunderstanding uh, of of use of natural products. And then they get stuck in this realm where I've tried it. I tried it. I'm not getting better. And then I get sick. Then I need antibiotic. And then I get told by the conventional system, see, these things don't work or shame on you for doing that. Or you waited too long. And now we have to actually do more than just the antibiotics. So we like to do that. Now in my patients, you know, some patients, for example, I'll give you an example when I would use an antibiotic. So I had a patient the other day, has H. pylori, which is a, a bacterial infection of, of an ulcer. And we have a protocol that we use very successfully. In the last six patients before this patient, we use the, the antimicrobial protocol of the natural herbs. And all six patients, you know, from positive goes to negative on the, on the testing, uh, on the H. pylori test. But this patient had such a bad ulcer in the stomach, even though we went through the treatment, when we post-tested her, it was still positive. So then I have to like now have to pull out the big guns because it's not responding to the protocol of it. Now it's rare, but it can still happen, and that just means that some people just have different, you know, uh, res they might even have some resistance to the natural therapies as well. So I try to use antibiotics very, very, you know, carefully, uh, and then we have to look at, you know, because of the microbiome dysfunctions and long-term uh, issues, and also what type of antibiotics we have to be very careful of. Like we avoid uh, fluoroquinolones, like Cipro and Levaquin in our practice, uh, because of those those kind of long-term toxicities. So there's this kind of a uh, 
some drugs are very good, like some things for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, like rifaximin, something's very specific that goes into small intestine, doesn't have an effect with your bad, back, uh, good bacteria, it, causes, you know, it doesn't go into the colon. And so there is certain antibiotics, again, that, that the average patient doesn't know. So they hear like, oh my God, I'm anti-antibiotics. I'm like, no, I'd rather give you that than sometimes the herbs because the herbs doesn't discriminate. Herbs, herbs knock out your good guys just as much as the bad guys. So you really have to have, a, a, again, an experienced clinician and that's what we can provide to our patients. And that's how I, when, I, when someone says, should I use an antibiotic or not? It's like, you should be following by a healthcare provider. You shouldn't be treating yourself. Do you recommend biopsies? When should you do it and when should you avoid it? Uh, yes, I do recommend biopsies if the biopsy is indicated, obviously. So that, you know, a lot of times, you know, and this kind of question is then leading towards like a cancerish kind of diagnosis, right? Because really we're looking at pathology and, and, and a level that's needed to be understand. But you have to understand what you're, what you're, what you're dealing with. If you are getting um, uh, an inflammatory response or if you're getting some kind of nodule bump or lump or something like that, that's suspicious. Aside of the other imaging techniques, aside of the other blood tests that might kind of point to that, you know, but the, 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 the tried and true in, the, in Western medicine is biopsy. And when they give biopsies, then, then they can tell you like what it is, you know, what kind of, it could just be inflammation, for example. Um, so we do recommend biopsies. Now, sometimes biopsies are done too much. Sometimes they're done too early. Uh, sometimes, it, you know, but that's all that you have to take in care in consideration, the history and physical and the overall, you know, what is the picture? So it's not like, again, everybody wants to be, don't do this or do this. It might seed your cancer. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Some types of biopsies, for example, of head and neck, it, it should be done by a qualified fine needle aspiration cytopathologist. If you have a head and neck mass, for example, and you send this person to ENT, family medicine, or general surgeon, they're more likely not to get the right uh, um, amount of or tissue correctly for the diagnosis. If it's done correctly, you get 96 to 98% accuracy of a diagnosis. And sometimes it could be like, okay, it's benign. Don't have to worry about it. We didn't have to take it out, mess anything up. Sometimes the cancer is that you want to keep it in there because it's, it's safer to treat it locally. And sometimes, you know, if they did a removal of it uh, inappropriately, that can spread. Okay, so there's, there's, you have to understand, like, when we do biopsies, then it's like, who's doing the biopsy is, and, you know, so I, I send people just to a specific side of pathology group here, uh, where I'm from, I don't send them to general, because if they go general, then they're most likely not to get the right uh, information, which stresses the patient out even more. So I am for biopsies, but that's, a, that, again, that's a level of clinical uh, evidence that you have to look at what's the risk benefit. And most of the time, we have to look at the benefit, because then we have to look at what are the treatment options that they may need. Doesn't mean that we still need to go for everything that they may not want. The idea is that from our perspective, we have to outlay everything that the options are there available for them. And if they do the right epigenetic out, uh, changes in their diet and lifestyle, most things will get better. If not, then we still have to intervene depending on the stage or where we're at. What can we do to prevent against bone fractures? There was a study that came out recently saying vegans have more bone fractures. What do you think about this? I don't. <laughs> But let me say, let me, go, let me go back to this. What do we need to do to prevent? That's an important part. What do we need to do to prevent bone fractures? Number one is we need to prevent falls, right? So none of the, so let, besides, besides, let's, besides the second part of the question, let's talk about the first part of the question is right now there's a big push in America, right? That most people take bone drugs, right? Bisphosphonates and these uh, injectable forms or oral forms. So we've been giving it for about 30 years now. The rate of rip of, of hip fracture has still basically remains static. Okay. It hasn't changed. And so we have to, we have to look at like, what are we doing? Are we, are, you know, can we increase bone density with some of these drugs? Yes. Is it, is it significant enough? to prevent them from having the fracture. No, it improves bone density, but it doesn't improve falling. Even when they take the natural therapies, because we have natural therapies, by the way, that can increase bone density. You know, my partner, her bone density increased 8% in one year, right? So yay, it's better than, it's like almost seven times higher than what the drugs can give, right? You know, so we still got to follow it. We still got to, but that doesn't prevent you from falling. The main thing that prevents you from breaking your hip is, is doing what we call yoga, is doing stretching, is doing flexion. Um, most Americans, unfortunately, and Europeans as well, uh, when we look at this data, especially from that study that was in the last part of that sentence there, that's looking at that vegans in England who are um, who are not taking adequate calcium or vitamin D. So if you look at any of the studies that show that if someone's vegan and they are, are taking in their diet, the amount of calcium that they're supposed to be taking like everybody else and the amount of vitamin D, the very else, they actually don't have lower, uh, higher amount of hip fractures. They actually have lower. Okay, and they have a lower risk of every other disease combined, right? The other reason what they're saying is why they might have had more fractures is because in general, most people who are plant-based are thinner, right? Their BMI is lower, right? Now, right now in America, 
obesity is a problem. Uh, 75% of patients over 20 are, 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 are overweight or obese. 42% are obese. 9% of Americans are morbidly obese. That's a BMI of over 40. That's having over 100 pounds over your base average you know, weight for your size. Okay. So um, those other risks of, of being heavier actually have a higher risk of death because you have higher risk of then heart attacks because vegans don't really get that, right? Uh, you know, diabetes, vegans really don't get that. You know, if they're, you know, again, healthy eating vegans, I'm not talking about junk food vegans, right? Um, but the idea is that, you know, th these are kind of studies that kind of push people to look at like, oh my God, this is like headline news. Like they want to have the debate of like paleo or standard American diet or, or industry saying you need to eat more of this. We have to look at, the other studies. So when we look at, there was three other studies since that study that came out, was which was reviews of all the literature. Okay, not just this little Oxford study of England and all. And when they look at, for example, the patients in the studies in the vegan studies in Asia, okay, like Indonesia and Vietnam and you know other parts of India and all stuff like that, um, they don't have that hip fracture increase. And the reason that we're looking at is, is it is it because they're they're stronger? No, is that they're doing daily exercises that prevent them from falling. So in the United States, for example, um, the people that I see fall and break their hip fractures are people who exercise a lot too. Because, you know, we're doing stair steppers, we're doing, you know, treadmills, we're doing all these things that are kind of mechanical, but they're not real, right? So, so you do a stair stepper, it's a, it's a calibrated height. So they're just training their body to go on the stair or, or just a treadmill, but we're not walking on uneven earth, which is like, you know, your yard, a trail, a path, the street, you know, a track kind of thing. We always want to be walking and you want to be doing flexible extension exercise. So those people who do yoga, for example, like China, the largest country of population in the world, India, the second, you know, they don't have this hip fracture problem as we do. And they don't have, you know, millions, they have millions more women and millions more people uh, who are elderly. And yet we don't see this, you know, oh, we need to give bisphosphonates to all these people. We need to do bone density. Why is it? Because they're always doing flexion, extension exercise. You know, the toilets are on the floor. They sit on the floor. I mean, my grandmother, you know, until the day she passed, she could sit and do yoga. And my grandfather, same thing. They were more flexible. And then when I used to go visit them in India, um, you know, I'd be the only American that have to bring a chair, you know, to the room, which is embarrassing in a whole room of uh, hundreds of people say we're at the temple or we're going to a festival is because, you know, I can't sit on the floor for six hours a day, you know, like I'm not as flexible as those people in those cultures because that's, they're used to that. They're used to like sitting down, getting up. And so what happens is by doing that flexion extension, they have more ability. Even Tai Chi, even Qigong has been shown to prevent hip fractures. So when you look at like two, 300 million people who do that every day in China, they don't have the hip fracture. The data shows that. So these are simple measures that we should be looking at before we even talk about like drugs or herbs. We're looking at, well, are, are you doing, are, are you still able to bend down and tie your shoes without falling over? You know, other, other common aspects of hip fractures is that most people trip over dogs. Most people have, you know, terrible slippers that they got for Christmas. Most people have carpets in their house that are not like kind of sealed down. So like what happens is for most people who fall and break their hip, it's like, okay, I'm going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I don't want to turn on the lights. I'm wearing my slippers and it catches on the end of the rug and it flips. I fall down and I break my hip. So, you know, what are we doing for that? Right. So the, so the main thing is like we have to look at are we doing uh, physical exercises that are actually balancing and strengthening our cere cerebellar aspect of understanding balance and flexion and extension, understanding, you know, uh, again, balance in terms of like not falling over and having that ability to not fall. Most people who do these kind of standard exercises, they actually will fall. So when I see a patient and they might go to the gym all the time and they, they fall and they, hit, they break their hip, they trip over something. It's always like in the parking lot at the grocery store. I was just stepping up, a, a, you know, because not all steps are also made correctly, right? So if it's a little bit off or a little bit rock on the parking lot, they step, they fall, even though they might be physically fit. So we have to understand that, you know, we have to look at those aspects. Now, going back to the, the bone drugs, the bone drugs actually um, improve the bone density, but they don't improve the bone strength, right? And so, so there's, there's a higher risk of what they call spiral fractures that are occurring in women. And so we have to understand, you know, uh, the, the other aspect of looking at that is that there's natural therapy. So there's a study that just came out recently. We have a uh, product that's a Chinese herbal product, and they actually did a study comparing it to the Fosamax. You know, it was a blinded study and they actually gave, you know, here's the Fosamax and here's the Chinese herb. They did the bone density. And after a year, the Chinese herb just did, did just as well as the Fosamax without the side effects. So is there things to, to help naturally that can increase bone density? Yeah. Do we top it off with other things that are ever, they're also in the literature to show that? Yes. Is that the only thing? No, because you still have to do these balancing and strengthening exercises because you can still fall, right? You can still have these issues. So the, um, now the other aspect is 
when we look at those people who uh, are not vegan, for example, say somebody's eating a standard American diet, um, we have to look at um, the aspect that the highest country, we're one of the top three countries that has the highest dairy consumption, right? So the higher the dairy consumption, the higher the osteoporosis. So, you know, when we're looking at, okay, they're looking at the small amount, and then the vegans were under 2,000 people in the study, by the way, okay? But when we look at the population right now, 99% of Americans aren't plant-based, but who's in the hospital right now that has hip fractures? Those people, right? So it's not that they got protected or had extra benefits. The inference from that question is that they're saying that, oh, if you eat this other way, you're doing better. But in fact, that may not be necessarily the case because in 30 years, that hasn't been shown to be true. So anyways, that's, that's my, my, my answer for bone density issues and fractures. Is brain fog a health condition? What works to get rid of it? So brain fog is a, a very loose term. And, and uh, is it real? Yes. It, but what it, to which person and which um, history are we getting from the patient that they're having brain fog? So for example, if they're an elderly patient or if they're a young patient, you know, uh, we have to assess what brain fog means. Sometimes it could, could it be post-chemo brain fog, you know, chemo brain. Can it be due to thyroid? Can it be to blood pressure? Can it be due to di longstanding diabetes or other inflammatory conditions? Could it be due to adrenal dysfunction? Um, so brain fog is a loose term. It, you know, Western medicine doesn't have a, you know, a true diagnosis for it because they can't biopsy it, number one, and there's not a blood test for it. But we have all experienced brain fog on some level, right? The days of your memory is just not very clear, you know, foggy. So that's kind of a nice idea, right? The fog is there. When it clears up, you have some days are very clear. Some days it's very, very foggy. So we have to look at what, are, what is the definition of brain fog. Now, for, for each person, though, it could be just fine-tuning thyroid and their memory function gets better. Sometimes it's fine-tuning and making sure the blood pressure is okay or making sure the blood sugar is good or making sure they're sleeping as well, or making sure their, their adrenal function is better, or making sure for everybody all across the board is making sure they have, you know, anti-inflammatory on board, you know, keeping that inflammation, because the more inflammation in the brain, the more brain fog you have, right? Regardless of where it's coming from, because so, it could be food allergies, could be some environmental toxins, could be stress. Usually it's a combination of all these things, but it's, it's keeping that inflammation down. Now, there is certain things that we give. Again, bosmeric being an anti-inflammatory helps lower the, the brain uh, inflammation. But there's also other aspects that we give, like uh, we have formulas like Be Mindful and, and Neural Formula Forte the, and even uh, Percepta uh, Professional. These are things that we actually can show that will improve your neurological function. Amyloband, these are certain parts of mushroom extracts that actually will stimulate your brain-derived nerve growth factor. So, um, so we have to be careful of just giving something, we have to look at well, why does this person need this and then target that. So some people actually have traumatic brain injury. Some people have, you know, they served in the military. Some people are boxers uh, and can have brain fog from a different perspective, right? You know, I'm a football player, a different perspective, traumatic brain injury, CTE issues. So their brain is actually having more inflammation because of in in injury. So there would be certain things like cannabidiols from hemp oil or other aspects. Again, like that there's certain extracts that we can give to help it regenerate their neurons. But someone else is just like, I just need a memory formula. Then there's easy certain things like that that can help that. There's certain, certain formulas that actually remove tau and beta amyloid and tangle proteins in the animal models. So we're looking at like on this, on this dementia early spectrum issue for memory, how can we help with that? Um, but the brain fog is interesting because you know it's loosely given, and we have to kind of critically define which patient and what it, what are what is their symptoms of having brain fog, and then address it appropriately. Is reversing early stage cancer with lifestyle easy or hard or impossible? <laughs> what about late stage cancer? What can be done to reverse it? So. Again, uh, quite a loaded question there, but uh, so the earlier of any disease, cancer included, is always easier to reverse, right? Um, than in late stage. Uh, but what, what really sets that apart, even on late stage, it depends on, number one, the type of cancer, because certain cancers are just more responsive, believe it or not. Certain cancers are very, very stubborn. Certain tissue types are very stubborn, even from a conventional standpoint. You know, certain, certain uh, chemotherapies, radiation surgeries are like, okay, sometimes you can just do a surgery and you're done. You don't even have to do chemo, sir, uh, chemo radiation, you know. Sometimes even natural therapies will help reduce that shrink if the body is good and takes care of it. So we have that experience all the time with our patients. The problem is 
when we start compounding comorbid conditions, right? So when we start adding diabetes onto it, we start adding heart disease onto it, and you start asking autoimmune disease and you know obesity and all these you know depression or and you know and stress levels, then it's like the body, your immune system is like working on twelve you know different things all the time, and it's and it's, it's ability to focus is then lessened. And so for those patients, you know, when I say follow the the steps in my book, you have to do all those steps because it's not a magic bullet. Everybody wants to say take this and you're done. You know, juice this and you're done. Or or take this drug and you're done. And it's not that, or, or again, do this yoga or, you know, whatever it is, do saunas. I mean, everybody wants to have some kind of detox or something. It's more complicated than that, but you have to understand the complexity and build a plan around how that person can get better. But it's always through monitoring, right? So the danger that we see in alternative medicine, you know, I'm integrative, so we're not alternative, is that, you know, we still have to do you know, MRIs and CT scans and PET scans and biopsies and blood work, we can follow the parameters. And sometimes you can do a little bit more, you know, less invasive. And sometimes you have to do more invasive, depending on the pathology of the patient and, and the progression of the disease. Um, and if they're responding, even better. Uh, if they're not responding, then we have to add more elements of, of treatment uh, there. But I don't think it's, it's, it's easy to say because if anybody says like, oh, you can just easily do this in reverse cancer, then they're not really actually treating cancer patients. They're just selling you programs or selling you some kind of health program or salt supplement or something like that. Um, you know, I've been doing this 20 years and I can say that each patient is uniquely different. You know, the, even though there's general data in the protocols that we provide, that is evidence-based and every day we're reviewing that data to say, which is different. Is there something new in the literature saying a certain metabolic pathway for cancer, for example, for, of that tissue type? However, it is not, it is not as easy to say like, oh, you know, a lot of these cancer clinics in Mexico and stuff like that, they have not shown the data. We've been there. We saw that. They didn't work to our, to our disappointment. Cause you know, you always want to say like, maybe there's something else that is there on the other grass is green on the other side, but they don't work. And in fact, you know, people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and don't survive. And that's the shock that, you know, most people might hear in this conference. Like, well, I heard that, I heard that that's a story. That's just myth. You know, a lot of these commercials that I even see on Facebook and all those people are not alive. <laughs> you know, it, you know, like you all know that because you don't know those people. Um, but so we have to, we have to be careful when it comes to treating cancer because a lot of people you know, we don't treat cancer. What we treat is lowering the inflammation, looking at the triggers, looking at the epigenetics, looking at what, what are the factors that makes the body have a difficulty in healing. And if we can appropriately gear that to switch in a positive direction, then the patient has a better improvement outcome. And not only that, it's like, even if patients are in say a later stage and they come to me and say, hey, I'm stage three, stage four, I'm gonna have to go through chemo, I have to go to radiation. Can we improve that outcome? Absolutely. Is there certain things that we can give the directly that will enhance the benefits and lower the side effects? Yes. Is there certain things that we cannot give during that because it has contraindication? Absolutely. And that's the difference between someone like me and someone who's just a naturopath or a conventional doc. Because conventional docs will say, don't take anything. And the natural docs will say, take everything. And you have to look at how the drug metabolizes pathways. And you have to understand both worlds. Like, how does this herb work once it's pharmacology? But then you have to understand pharmacology and metabolism and how the liver works. And these are two different worlds of, of like classes of alternative practitioners and conventional practitioners. And so when we look at blending that, then we know this drug you can take, it works better, it'll enhance your radiation, it'll lower your chemotherapy and make it more effective. And certain things like you can't take during this treatment because it'll interfere and you'll have more side effects. And so that's how we have to look at bringing uh, this, this use of natural medicines for cancer patients is again by an experienced clinician. How do you permanently get rid of candida? Wow. Okay. So that's a misunderstanding of candida. <laughs> and again, that just tells me that a lot of people are thinking like, oh, I always have candida, I have candida, I have candida, I have these gas and bloating symptoms. I have sugar cravings and all stuff like it's some kind, there's some kind of microbiome dysfunction. Interesting thing that we find though, in the last 10 years is that when we do uh, microbiome testing, and now we're understanding like now what we call small intestinal bacterial overgrowths and also colon gut dysbiosis, most of my patients now are not coming out with candida. They're coming out with overgrowth of bacteria. So yes, some people can have, I'd say maybe 15%, 10% of the, our patients in practice will have some kind of yeast or candida or species of mycology growing out on, on stool culture uh, that's over the norm. But, but the symptoms, remember, are very similar, right? So if, whether they're having bacteria or, 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 or a, a fungal organism, um, bloating, gas, you know, constipation, diarrhea, brain fog, fatigue, you know, all this stuff, it, it, it doesn't matter which one, right? Because bo both these, any kind of overgrowth 
or, or dysbiosis in your microbiome can, is, will cause those symptoms. So classically, you know, we used to think it was candida. Like classically, you know, natural therapies were giving people to do candida cleanses and candida products. The problem is candida products are very specific to fungal organisms usually. Okay. Now, if someone doesn't have that, which a lot of people come and say, I have a candida, candida. Oh, I've been treating myself. I've been treating myself with these products over, uh, you know, by my practitioners or on, on the shelf, the health market is that if, when they come back, if they don't have that candida, you have to understand that, that these are natural medicines in a way, right? They're antimicrobials, as I mentioned before in the earlier question. So you have to give it for a specific time and a specific potency, and then you got, you're done. So a lot of people like take it, I take it like for months, like, oh, I'm, I'm taking this candida cleanse product. It's, main, it's keeping my candida down. If you don't have candida, you're just killing more of your good guys, your good probiotics and just causing dysfunction in microbiome. You wouldn't take amoxicillin or Cipro or Augmentin or Bactrim every day for six months either, right? But people don't understand that because they're not trained that this is actually antimicrobial. They think it's only going to kill bad stuff and not good stuff. It doesn't discriminate. It's antimicrobial. So whether it's natural or by, you know, I say by Pfizer or by the farm, it's the mechanism of action. They're not trained in that. And so a lot of people say, just keep giving it, keep giving it. So we have to be careful because again, what's an antifungal is treated differently than what's an antibacterial. So then they have now a bacterial overgrowth because they keep on knocking out the good guys, no more candida. Now we have this bacterial overgrowth and never gets truly better is because they're not using the right antimicrobial for that class. So getting rid of candida. Now, when we test candida, a lot of people can come back with no growth. Some people have normal growth within a normal range. It's just not elevated. It's not a considered an overgrowth. So again, but that's a misperception that people think like, oh my God, I have something, you know, there's, there's four pounds of a hundred trillion of over a thousand species of probiotics in your gut. In fact, there's a study just came out just the other day on memory problems in dementia patients. And they found that there's 700 probiotics in your mouth. And with people have periodontal disease and inflammation in their gums, they have a higher risk of beta amyloid in their brain. Right? So, you know, all this is related, but you know, it's, it's not as simple as like, oh, I just got to get rid of candida because that's actually going to be an issue. We don't look at getting rid of, we're looking at having everything in your microbiome being in balance. And that's why you have to monitor that. You have to, you have to study that. And you, it's not as simple as just get rid of it by taking something over the counter or taking something from a natural health provider. Do you recommend colonoscopies for people who eat and live a healthy whole plant food, plant-based diet and lifestyle? Sure. Why not? Uh, <laughs> you know, that, again, that question is implying, well, if I went plant-based, I wouldn't need a colonoscopy. Now, if someone was always plant-based in their lifestyle, say they've been vegan all their life, their, their risk of getting a colonoscopy or having a positive colonoscopy, if they got one, would be the lowest, okay? Because we're getting phytonutrients, we're getting tons of fiber, we're getting you know, anti-inflammatory proteins and, and phytonutrients and antioxidants. However, you know, this, this, is, this conference is geared to most people who haven't been that way. Health, that's why they're watching, that's why they're listening to these interviews. And so they're looking at, okay, I just changed six months ago or last year. That doesn't include the last 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of not. Right now, what the colonoscopy is impo important for is that we can actually see pathology before it presents. So we can see a polyp, we can see a tumor, we can see you know inflammation, we can see diverticulosis, diverticulitis, we can see strictures, we can see all sorts of things that you can't see until it's a little bit too late. So when people actually have a tumor and they're having bleeding from their bottom, or they're having some kind of gut dysfunction, or some kind of you know you know obstruction or something, then we already know it's late. You're in the game. You know it's going to be probably something they don't want to hear: surgery, chemo, radiation. In, in, you know, in, in fact, um, but if it's a polyp, you know, they remove these polyps and if they remove the polyp, then the ability of having that polyp come back is significantly reduced if they are on a plant-based diet. So I always tell people, you know, if you, if you're changing your diet, great, you should do that hundred percent. If you get a colonoscopy and they take a couple of polyps, then by the time you do the next one, they'll probably have no polyps. We see people always like that where they're always positive with polyps and then they go plant-based, they get their repeat. They're like, wow, what happened? After that though, after they have a clean colonoscopy, if they stay with that diet and lifestyle, their likelihood of getting colon problems is lower. So then yes, the, the risk is lower. Now there is now tests as you see on the commercials on television that there's these like little kits that people can do and it screens for colon cancer. So that's good, but it still doesn't tell us whether they have polyps or other pathology. So if you get a test like that, it's good because people don't have to go through the, you know, un, you know, the procedure, which then, you know, not comfortable, obviously. And people are afraid of those kind of things like that. So I understand that. 
The problem is if it's positive, you're in. Like you got to get colon because it's positive. You have you have a risk of now you have, you have we have to now we have to now find where that cancer is at, right? So so I'm always about prevention uh, and screening and colonoscopies are super important. Now over time there's going to be probably other like in in the future you know imaging studies, other things that might you know probably better blood tests that you know. But until we get there, uh, I do recommend colonoscopy screening. And in fact, just, just letting you know, the more recent guidelines uh, due to colon cancer. So colon cancer is number two in both men and women, right? So, so, so breast cancer in women, number one, prostate uh, cancer, number one in men. But number two in both men and women is colon cancer. So now the colon cancer rates are so high and they're going at younger and younger patients that the, I think I believe the new recommendations are now like either 45 or even 40 in certain cases with higher risk. Because right now, like just last year, even before COVID, I had six patients under 30 that already had stage three, stage four colon cancer. This is all predominantly due to, to paleo, di paleo diets, standard, you know, like high animal protein diet and, you know, all that stuff like that. But, you know, we're seeing this more and more because it's the trend in, you know, marketing and, and advertising. So due to these kind of tr what, I, what I call misleading, false, dangerous food dietary trends, which is, you know, predominates American uh, social media and marketing is that this is the reason why now we have to have these guidelines go further because people will do this for many, many years until they figure out it's not good for them, but then they've already set in pathology or disease uh, and therefore they need to have screening. What are your thoughts on the first year of COVID-19 from February, 2020 to April, 2021? In other words, what happened? <laughs> why did it happen? And what's next? Wow. <laughs> uh, that's a big question. So an inflammation nation happened. What happened was this. I mean, now let me just stop a little away from the politics for a second, but let me just look at from the, from a historical perspective, what happened was, you know, we have government agencies, we have scientists, we have departments of people who study pandemics. They study, uh, you know, all sorts of you know, communicable diseases, life-threatening issues that we don't know on a daily basis. Just like, you know, right here, we have Los Alamos, we have Sandia laboratories. They do all sorts of research. We don't even know what they do, but you know, sometimes what's on your phone, that technology was discovered there. The, the Mars just landed a helicopter uh, on Mars. There's a little like ro robot helicopter landed. Someone here at Los Alamos just made that technology happen. So, so, so there's things that come at, you know, that there's always someone that's working that we don't even know, right? But in public health, there's just as many people who are doing those things. And so what we have to be, understand is that the previous administration, which was Obama administration, and previous one before that as well, there's agency of people who've been following, you know, Zika, Ebola, you know, and they had a whole playbook. They have, there's actually documentaries now, not political. There's looking at like this, where do the, you know, people say, where did government fail or how did this happen or whatever? It's because we've had a whole like playbook. This is what happens because it's not like, uh, COVID happened and nobody knew like what was going on. It's like, we were just looking at, well, when's the next pandemic going to come? We don't know what was going to be COVID, but this is just time and and you know population deforestation whatever you're talking about you know we also have labs that work with this in the united states and elsewhere it's happened before it's going to happen again on some level right human error or human pushing on nature uh stress right and cross transmission so when it happens but that playbook was actually thrown away trump administration came in i hate to say that they came in they threw it away when the first couple of weeks they came and they said, we don't need that department. We don't know those people. Boom. They had a whole plan. This is what you need to do. Go on. So when it came, playbook wasn't there. They're like, oh, then the politics was, you know, unfortunately here was making, in my opinion here, was making public health a, a, a political issue. And if you look at most socialized medicine countries, you know, they did really well in terms of controlling the numbers. Okay. We are 4% of the world's population and we have 24% of the COVID cases. 4% of the world's population, 24%. Of, we have lost now 566,000 plus Americans uh, since last year, okay? Which is, to me, is, is, is in my lifetime, I never thought we would have something like this as a physician. Um, I'm too young to remember, you know, World War II. Uh, I, I'm too young to kind of really remember Vietnam. Uh, I, do rem I do know Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, those kind of things. More people died from COVID. Now, it doesn't mean that, that I, I, less you know, heroic heroism for those people who fought wars. But, you know, when we look at this, these numbers to kind of just put it in perspective, because the average person is so numbed now when they look at the number, like, okay, so many people died today. It's just, it's just like the news. It's like the weather it just passes them by. And they don't understand that that's someone's mother, that's someone's kid, that's someone's grandparents or someone's wife or daughter has passed away from a virus. 
right? Is public health was lost. Public health was thrown away where politicians were, were kind of stepping on top of just for political gain scientists who's been doing this for thousands of you know hundreds of years like this information is passing by and we do studies and 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 yes it's an evolving science sometimes we have to make judgments but the judgment is still better from someone who is trained in understanding science than someone who's just trying to score political points and the political points now is on the death of 566,000 Americans going for it right we have 16 trillion dollars lost to the economy 16 trillion due to the loss of these lives Okay, and we have now another 3.4 or whatever, how many four trillion that we have to do in COVID relief packages. So we're now talking about 20 trillion dollars is lost just because of a political aspect of like, oh, we want we don't want to make this sound like bad that we have to close down. We needed to hunker down. We needed to do mass scoring. We need to have social distancing. Every other country that did that really well didn't get hit. That's why their numbers are lower. Now, the problem is, since we didn't hunker down, we didn't do it well, even though we have the vaccines out right now. Right. The problem is, is that the variants are now spreading. So now we're seeing a lower population having problems because people, you know, again, certain states are having political issues. So where what happened was that we didn't follow the scientists. We followed politicians. We made it a political issue. And now we're all suffering worldwide, globally. You know, and it's not to say, like, should we blame these people or should we blame those people? It's like this is going to happen again and we need to be prepared. Now, the other sad part about this whole aspect is it does come to light. And I'll explain in my lecture when I give it on, on this conference is using COVID as an example. Aside of social distancing, aside of you know, half of Americans not wanting to believe it or social disinformation of understanding how severe this, this, this condition was, 2% morbidity and mortality is still a lot of people. 560,000 people, a lot of people. It's like knocking out almost all of Albuquerque. And, you know, if you know somebody from Albuquerque, it'd be sad. So uh, it's terrible. But what we didn't understand is, is the ramification that Americans did terrible aside of not social distancing is that we're not healthy. You know, we're not healthier than any of these other countries. And, you know, so when we're like 46 out of 48 industrial nations in terms of outcomes of chronic disease, you know, uh, you know, again, like I mentioned before with obesity, how many patients, how many people are, are obese in America, right? Uh, heart disease, diabetes, you know, lung disease, chronic kidney disease. These are all the, the top core morbid conditions that if you have that, you're more likely to get hospitalized and more likely to die. And so, we're not doing well, but you know, the virus also doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether blue state or red state, you know, some people are just aren't even interested in politics and they still will die. Right. So we have to, we have to really be taking care and, and taking this as a serious issue. The problem is it became political and the political aspect is now going forward. Um, we need to start respecting the scientists. And I think we're going to have generations of, of questioning going forward. Like, you know, looking back in retro, like, you know, right now we're still in the pandemic. We still haven't fixed it. Everything economy hasn't got up yet. But over time, you know, uh, when we look back, say, five years from now, 10, 10 years from now, there's going to be a, a historical look at, like, how do we even let this happen? How do we even let politicians, how do we even let, you know, public health get thrown the wayside just for political gain off the cost of American lives? This is something that, you know, tragically we'll look back, just like we looked at certain wars. And sometimes like, oh, that was a bad call. You know, it might have been good at the time, maybe politically or, you know, but, in, you know, hindsight 2020. But there was a lot of foresight that they had. There was information there. There was already experts there. There was things that we could have mitigated the loss uh, so that so many people wouldn't have died. So I think everything went wrong. And again, more reason why people should look at an inflammation nation because now there's another reason. So uh, say if you don't have any of these other comorbid conditions, how can you still lower your risk of even getting a variant of any other type of virus or any other thing coming in the, in, in the future? That's going to be the groundwork for people to look at the 10 steps definitively to preventing, reversing, and treating all diseases. What can you do to prevent dementia, Alzheimer's, and memory loss? So first of all, eating a plant-based diet, number one. We're now understanding that, you remember, it's, the brain is just it's inflammation in the brain, right? Over decades, it didn't happen once. It didn't, it's not just like it happened overnight. No one's memory just goes over out like this. It's just like, oh yeah, I'm getting, you know, we're getting older. We're getting senior moments, we call it, right? Then a little bit more brain fog maybe. Uh, and then eventually we get this mild dementia. We can get Parkinson's. We can get some Alzheimer's diseases, but it's a progression over time where it just gets worse and worse. And then when we look at the scans, we look at beta amyloid, tau proteins, tangles, just different neurological aspects of dysfunction that are really triggered by inflammation. So getting an anti-inflammatory early on uh, the better, like Boss America. I mean, I keep on saying that over and over because it's one of the things like we have so much data, yet there's misunderstanding of why, what to take out there and, 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 and you know, potency, purity, safety, and efficacy. 
lowering that inflammation. So blood sugar is important. So now we call something called type three diabetes. When the blood sugar is just slightly elevated. So someone's like A1C, their three month blood sugar average, hemoglobin A1C, it's just slightly elevated. So let's say above 5.4 to say 6.2. So they won't say like, it's not terrible diabetes. It just got a blood sugar intolerance. Well, they let it slide. They let it slide. So like, oh, you're 50, you're 60, you're 70, you're 80. Okay. You know, you're 80 years old. It should be that way. No, it shouldn't be. It should be normal. Normal is normal. And when I was a medical student, you know, it was anything above 5.4 was considered a problem. And now it's like, you know, they can let it slide over here, 6.2, 6.5, depending on the lab. As people get more diabetic, the labs also stretch. So the average, what we're calling the normal range, is also extended. So we know that, that that high blood sugar, even if it's just a little bit elevated, triggers inflammatory response to the brain over time. So it's not an acute insult. It's a chronic low-grade insult. So lowering the blood sugar is super important because it lowers systemic inflammation, lowers your risk of heart disease, lowers your risk of blood pressure and weight gain. So, so the idea of like, you know, waiting to someone's a diabetic to intervene is, is kind of like the wrong approach. We have to look at if there's any kind of insulin resistance or dysglycemia, it needs to be addressed now. Uh, and even if they're older, the lower that we, we, we bring that down, the, the better they're improving their overall cognitive function. Keeping the brain active is important as well. So the biggest challenge that we see in the in American culture is that when people retire, we don't use our brain as much, right? So when people are working, they're busy, they're, you know, everybody's in their practice or they, they work for a company, you know, so they're always kind of doing something with their brain. And then when we retire, the problem is that we're not as actively engaging our, our neurological function. So what happens is like we watch more television, right? So if you go to any nursing home, what do they do? They pull them out, put them in front of the TV, let them, the TV babysit them. This is just passive information that's coming into their brain. It's not active. And when we look at all the other cultures, cultures and we look at all the studies saying like crossword puzzles, Everybody, you know, New York subway is doing Sudoku, whatever, all those things, right? There's a reason for that because you have to actively engage to keep the neurons functioning, to keep the, you know, it's kind of like it's the thing of a brain as a muscle in a way. It's like, you know, use it or lose it. Like same thing with exercise. We got to still, as we're older, we still got to take walks. We still got to do some gardening. We still got to do some yoga. We still got to keep or maintain our muscle mass. So same thing. We got to keep the brain active. And the problem here in America is it becomes a passive. It seems like once we hit an age of retirement, uh, it's just more passive. So there's, so there's a little bit of environment diet uh, issues. The other thing is we have to look at is um, environmental toxins. And so with our patients, when we look at nutrient deficiencies and toxicities, always elevated. So uh, meaning people have deficiencies. So B12, folate, all the B vitamins, they can have deficiencies of CoQ10 and glutathione, how their body's detoxifying its environmental exposures and looking at heavy metals. Uh, you know, you don't have to live in Flint to have a problem, as I tell my patients. And we have patients all over the gamut from all over the country because I do Zoom consultations from people all over the country, even all over the world. I had a guy just the other day in England and his arsenic was way off the chart, like so toxic off the chart. And then, so now we have to figure out where is an environment? Is he coming in with, you know, and he's got a chronic inflammatory condition. Now, is it the only cause? No. Is it a contributing cause for him not healing? Yes. And so we have to look at all these different things. And believe it or not, nobody's uh, free of, of having exposure. Our food, our air, our water is, is always now um, even more and more going forward in time is, is somewhat contaminated. So lowering those risks uh, will improve your, your rate and lowering uh, that, the, the rate of getting dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Should we assume that our doctors are getting the best information on healing from their medical school training, medical journals, and the scientific community? Um, so I'm going to clarify that question. So the question should be, are they getting the best medical training? Because the word healing is, is, is basically a, I think it's biased. And it's biased on two ways, biased correctly and biased incorrectly. Doesn't mean that the medical schools and the journals and, and all the things you mentioned, the you know, scientific communities and all are, are leading them astray. Just means that the concept of healing has not been incorporated in the conventional model in general. Because the conventional model, the allopathic model, was designed on you know, treating symptoms or removing the problem itself, right? But when you look at traditional medicine, now I'm not talking about alternative medicine because alternative medicine is not evidence-based in my opinion, okay? When you look at traditional medicine, okay, or you can look at plant-based diet. But, you know, when we have data that has been published, right? Peer-reviewed and published, doesn't matter what language it is, but it's peer-reviewed and published. We can show that there's data to show that it supports. So when you look at traditional medicine, like Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine, and you know, the use of certain natural therapies or just even diet alone, the data will show uh, immense benefits. And so we have to be careful of those kind of aspects, sorry, of, of keeping um, that information correct. 
Um, so, so healing, let me go back to healing, healing the word heal or the, the word cure is not, is not introduced in, in the Western terminology. And, you know, there's a fear of liability, I believe, and, and all that stuff like that. But when we look at like, if you went to Europe, if you went to India, if you went to China, if you went to South America, whatever, the word cure is used a lot. Now, it's not there to um, misguide the patient or provide them false hope. But what it is there is to plant the seed of epigenetics that they do have the ability to heal. And so when someone hears the word cure on some level, now, again, in America, it might be a lot of bad people just throwing the word cure around, you know, <laughs> just drink this potion, and you're gonna be cured, because that's a little bit of, a, you know, let's put it in the context. But when a physician, a true physician is telling you that the, the body can heal itself, and they say, yeah, you know, when I was in Europe, and I was in India, when I, and I'd go see them in the hospitals, they use this word, you know, not loosely, but directly to tell the patient that there is opportunity to overcome this. If the patient understands that and takes it to true to heart, their epigenetics is also changing in that form and fashion, regardless of the therapies, whether it's a natural, whether it's conventional, it does better, right? But when we remove that word healing and cure from the body, it's just like we're managing. So, so we're, what Western medicine does really well, by the way, uh, on a, probably the best level possible is management. But at the end of the day, we don't want to be managed. I always tell my patients, like, you know, if someone's managing your money, you're being managed, right? Like they're taking a fee, blah, blah, blah. They don't really care. They're making money off your, off your fund or your pension fund. Or whatever. But if you, if you have control of your own money, then you're actually making more profit and you actually have more gain, right? And so the idea is same thing with your health. You should not be managing your health. You should be balancing your health. You should be, you know, rejuvenating, restoring, you know, uh, invigorating your health. And, and that's what is missing in medical school because it's always a, it's a dis disease model. Model, and it's, it's forgetting the dis-ease of the patient. And we want to look at is, can we improve this disease before it gets to disease? And if we have disease, can we actually reverse that disease? But, you know, in Western medicine, unfortunately, what they don't teach is reversal of disease, right? And what we're seeing now with the, the data with plant-based diets, for example, 80 to 82% of all diseases would get better, right? Just on the diet. So if we were just to focus on that, but again, you know, in medical school, that's just a, you know, if someone has a nutrition class in medical school, but that doesn't mean that naturopaths and chiropractors and natural, you know, all these alternative providers have any better education in nutrition. In fact, they don't usually. And that's why they're also still pushing ketogenic and paleo diets and, you know, misinformation of colon health. So, so there's a little bit of like, yeah, just because your doctor doesn't talk correctly about nutrition doesn't mean that the alternative providers have any credible education and understanding of actually true nutrition as well. Right. So I want I always want to leave, level that playing field because just because someone might talk about diet and the other doctor doesn't doesn't mean that what they're talking about is correct right so that that's because if it was we'd see this huge population shift where certain people seeing certain type of providers were the healthiest of all in fact we aren't and so it's now lifestyle medicine or we look at plant-based diets or we look at integrative people who are talking you know who are evidence-based like me we can actually start seeing that data showing huge immense changes and that's why places like kaiser permanente they have a whole like their whole recommendation now is plant-based because they're looking at well god the data is so strong they had 400 doctors that were plant-based in their in their system now it's becoming like you get a brochure like you should be eating this way the data says they will save millions of dollars alone by doing such so Definitely going uh, to to understanding health and 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 healing is not in medical system, but that doesn't mean that that is they still need to learn how to treat symptoms. They still need how to you know do emergency medicine. We still have to have this basic training that we still do have. We still need to treat for you know test for drugs and yes yes yes. You know I'm not anti pharma. We're just we're just pro patient pro safety pro data. And so if the patient you know sometimes you know if you're burning, I'm calling the fire department. Right, I'm not going to sit here and use a little spray bottle or throw some water on you. Like, no, we need to call the fire department. Right now, once that fire is down, can we can we look at how to prevent that fire from reigniting? Yes. Do we have to keep calling the fire department? That's where medicine becomes like, well, we'll just keep bringing the fire department out and just put out the fire. The drugs are important, and and sometimes procedures are important to get the patient through that crisis. But from our perspective, is like, can we avoid the crisis? Number one, yes. And number two is, can we then also prevent them from having the the fire again? Absolutely. Um, but I don't think I want to make it that, you know, they're not training correctly. That's a, that's a misunderstanding. It's, it's like, because, you know, on the natural side, I'll give you an example. The natural side says everything is easy, right? Naturopaths, chiropractors, everything is easy. And then when, when, when things go wrong, go see a doctor, right? So then they're not taking the responsibility either, right? They can treat all they want. And then when the tumor gets, doesn't go better, oh, you got to go see oncology now, or you got to go see a real doctor. Well, 
I thought you were a doctor because you're playing doctor, right? So there's a little bit like, uh, you know, not to put down people, but I, I want to level the playing field. When people step into this role of taking responsibility, the responsibility should be care, uh, careful of what they say. Um, not everybody's going to respond as, as good as you want. Not everybody's going to be as compliant, more importantly, as you want. Life is not easy to change old habits, right? But I, I don't want to blame the conventional system for saying, that they're not getting good training or, or mistrustful training. I just think that the, the, the angle that I would tell people is that you want someone who has the Western training and then they need to do integrative training so they can understand all these other things like diet, lifestyle, natural therapies, you know, and how to encompass. So you're actually providing the best of everything. What about eggs? Are they healthy? And what about egg whites? I think I know who answered who asked this question, by the way. <laughs> So no, no, no. So interesting thing, um, the USDA, so this is the government now. This is not, this is not, you know, this is not, uh, you know, a plant-based doctor or something like that saying this. The US federal government now, you know, you cannot say for eggs that it's nutritious. You can't say that it's healthy. You can't even say that it's safe because that would, that would be illegal, misleading marketing aspects. And the FCC and the government will come down to find you. So they can talk everything else about eggs, right? Which everybody will do, by the way. Let's say how it has a little bit. You can't say that it's low fat. You can't say it's low in saturated fat. Can't say it has phytonutrients. Can't say it has fiber. Can't, you know. So, and you can't really say it's a really great source of protein, although they kind of talk around that, right? So at the end of the day, no, it, it is not healthy. It's not safe. And this is from this is from the people who are lobbied by, by the way, you know, like who's pushing, I mean, because in every single restaurant, right, for breakfast, or here in New Mexico, every breakfast burrito or Wavis Rancheros, right, is eggs, eggs, eggs. So we still sell it. We just still prove it. We just can't say that it's healthy, nutritious, or safe. So if something can't be, if you can't say that about a food, then what does that tell you? It tells you that it's not healthy. It tells you it's not nutritious, not safe. You know, we still sell it. You know, gun, they sell guns. You know, I could probably say the same thing. Probably not, not safe. They still sell it, right? Now, you can do whatever you want with it, but, you know, probably people are going to get hurt. So uh, it does increase heart disease, you know, just a study came out the other day showing that one egg, uh, uh, you know, one egg a week increases, you know, doubles your risk of prostate cancer for men. Three eggs a day increases 81%. So when we see like, you know, prostate cancer, you know, number one cause of, well, what do we see? High animal protein diet, high dairy, high beef, you know, uh, you know, eggs, bacon, blah, 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 saturated fat, alcohol, blah, 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 lack of exercise, uh, pro-inflammatory foods. Yeah there's prostate cancer. And when people go to plant-based diets, you know, even Dr. Ornish many, many years ago in the first studies showed that you can actually reverse the PSA and actually change the progression of prostate cancer disease by just diet. Obviously, there's a lot of natural things that we can also do to help augment that, that are in clinical studies and clinical trials and stuff like that. So, so the idea is that, you know, eggs, I'm not a proponent of. Now, is there, is there, I think you mentioned egg whites, that was the idea that people were saying, well, let's, the yolks have cholesterol, so let's remove it. But it's still a pro-inflammatory food. You know, in fact, when we do food testing uh, on looking at people's immune system, okay, we're not talking about just animal or plant protein because you can be allergic to gluten, you can be allergic to soy or corn or tomatoes, whatever you want, right? But when you look at the testing overall, one of the highest foods that come back in the animal category that is kind of triggering an inflammatory response from an immunological perspective in terms of food sensitivity testing is eggs. In fact, mine was the highest, by the way. If you read my book, you know, you, you hear some of my, if you watch my video from the uh, Truth About Health last year, I give my introduction. I'm not going to do it this year. I'm going to start off in a different section. But if you understand that, you'll say like, wow, my chronic eczema was due to eggs. And I had a delayed reaction about 72 hours later after eating eggs. I get a chronic eczema since age two, up until 34, until I went plant-based and then it went away completely because I'm not eating it. Um, Again, from a different perspective, right? But, but eggs are not nutritious. Now, there is plant-based eggs options out there. There's one that's made out of mung bean protein. I use it every once in a while. I like want to have a scrambled egg. want to have a kind of a standard, you know, IHOP, you know, Denny's type of breakfast. Uh, fine. It just still doesn't have the cholesterol. Still has, you know, you know it's, it's one of the things that's a healthier option. So uh, I'm not a big, uh, people can have tofu scrambles. There's all these sorts of new kind of these, you know, plant-based uh, egg options, but I'm not an advocate of people eating eggs. So that's why vegetarians now have to even tighten up the diet even more because vegetarians ate more eggs and more dairy. And the data is showing that those, the, those out of the animal proteins are sometimes the worst. Should we eat whole food, plant-based fats like raw seeds, raw nuts, raw olives, and avocados, or should we limit them? 
uh, we should eat them, but also, de- you know, le- depends on how much you're eating, right? Like we can overdo so much. I give you an example. Um, that doesn't mean to be everything has to be raw, but from, from the, in the inference of the question is that raw food or real food is better, right? So, um, but, you know, do I have my patients eat nut butters? Absolutely. You know, uh, the problem with, we have to be careful with nut butters is the extra added oil or sugar, right? So I can go get like a sunflower seed butter. That's I use because I'm allergic to nuts, right? So I'm saying I'm using some, but if I go to the store, I can see like four or five different types. There's one that says added sugar or no sugar. There's one with added oil. I'm just looking at just getting the, the sunflower seeds and having it blended with no extra added oil or sugar. That's what I eat. It's as clean as you can get, right? Now, some people go to the health store and you can see that they have like, you know, they grind their own nuts into nut butters. That's fine because you're not, but what you'll see is sometimes when you get it from this, when you get it prepackaged, if they add a lot of oil, there's a, a lot of oil on top. Now, the, there's going to be a certain amount of fat in the, in the nuts itself. So if you did it yourself, there's still going to be some oil over time. But a lot of times that's the thinning out. So if you see like, if it says like peanut butter or cashew butter, and then it says sunflower, safflower, canola, blah, blah, oil, then that's just giving you less peanut nut butter in your jar, right? That's just, you know, or adding sugar a lot of times because, you know, tastes good, right? Sweet and fat and oil. Um, and also it's another way to make sometimes lesser quality nuts taste better, right? So someone's like, you know, I can give you third rate nuts. If I throw more sugar in there, it's going to taste a lot like, you know, it tastes like a, a candy. Um, so we got to be careful of that. Um, the other thing is people who are um, trying to lose weight, uh, that's the issue with the nuts and seeds. Um, I, I tell people, you know, they always say like an ounce a day. Uh, the problem with like the oils, so like the, re- the refined fats, uh, olive oil and those kind of things, you know, using it a little bit for cooking is fine. I don't like using olive oil on the pan because it's, you don't want to remember it's a high smoke, uh, low smoke point. So you don't want to, you, know, you don't want to ever want to cook like fry with olive oil, even though most people do it just oxidizes. It's terrible. So there's other types of oils, but, but oil is not a health food. So even though it says superfood on the bottle of the store, it's not good for you. It's a refined product. So, you know, you know, avocado, sunflower, safflower, you know, all those things like that, grapeseed, you know, we use that in cooking all the time, but I use it for like kind of minimally sparingly. Cause I just need to get, if you get the right kind of pan, for example, then you don't have to use all that stuff as much, right? So the idea is that that's just one of the switches. The other thing is a heavy fat calorie. So when we look at a tablespoon of oil being about 200, 210 calories, depending on the source, then you know people who are trying to lose weight, it's like they're putting oil, say you've had an Italian restaurant, they put the oil, they put the herbs and they're dipping their bread, you know, like that. Well, you know, a tablespoon is not much. So in the ta- you know, they'll put like three or four tablespoons. You already had a thousand calories before you even had the the meal, the pasta and the, the wine and you know the, the dessert and to be like, oh, I can't lose weight. You know, all the carbs, the carbs, the carbs. It's not necessarily the carbs all the time is, is the problem. The problem is that you're having oils are heavy nutrient dense food. Now, where that can be beneficial, though, for cancer patients or people who have problems with digestion or they're losing weight, how can we increase their caloric intake? Very simply, if they're having issues, is adding more of the, the, the fats that way because it's easier to consume, higher nutrient density. Also, people have gut issues. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big raw person until the person's microbiome and gut. So if they have like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, they have, you know, low digestive enzyme functioning when we test them, uh, you know, they have other digestive issues, then having like raw seeds and nuts can actually, add, it's like, it's it's hard for them to break it down. And then they have more issues with the diverticulitis or diverticulosis issues of just because they're not, the seeds can actually impact and cause some inflammation in the colon. So that's where sometimes using a seed butter or nut butter would be beneficial. Um, but yes, we have to be careful because people kind of go on the spectrum of like just eating cans and cans of, of nuts. And they're like, I can't lose weight. It's a high you know calorie, but people should be eating seeds and nuts to get the healthy fat. So yes, avocados and, and all the seeds that you mentioned, we like that uh, just within you know a realm of like, like how much is too much? Well, you want to look at like you need some for that the healthy fats. I recommend with my patients, since I'm a more a little bit more of a foodie, if I have seeds and nuts, I usually get raw and also get roasted. Now, roasted has less nutritional content, but roasted always for me has always a little bit better flavor in a way. It's a little crunchy, so I get a like a bag of say organic sunflower seeds and a bag of organic roasted sunflower seeds. I mix them, put them in a jar, put a little bit of tamari, or put a little cayenne, or put a little bit of Himalayan salt if you want. Uh, you know, and then shake it up and then you get that kind of best of both worlds. How do we heal food sensitivities and allergies? So that's my specialty, you know, in, in, you know, and you, you'll read from my book and you'll read from last year's video. Hopefully everybody goes back and watches the video. Cause I go into detail about food, food sensitivities and food allergies. Cause so near dear to myself, I have two sensitivities. I have uh, anaphylactic peanut allergy. So I'm that kid, the peanut allergy kid carrying an EpiPen with me. And then also have a delayed strong allergy as well. That was triggering my eczema. 
And so when we look at food allergies, we, we test it. We like to do blood testing. We do specific blood testing. Now, the controversy of the blood testing is the following. Conventional allergists only do what they call IgE testing, which is like looking for the anaphylactic peanut allergy like mine. So when, you, when someone goes sees an allergist, they usually do like eight things, eggs, dairy, shellfish, watermelon, peanuts, you know, things that, that people might eat have an anaphylactic reaction, tongue swelling, you know, respiratory issues. I need to have an EpiPen life, life threatening allergy. 2% of the people or less have this allergy. 98% of people don't, but they can still trigger an inflammatory response within an hour. This is where conventional medicine is failing because they're just looking at, you know, if you have a life threatening issue, we can help you. And if you don't have a life threatening issue, then follow up with your primary care, you know, kind of issue. And so anything that's chronic, that's just triggering an inflammatory response, but it's not life threatening. So if you're having heartburn, reflux, diarrhea, constipation, if you're having headaches, if you have joint pain, any kind of itis symptom, you can have that either within an hour of eating a food or there's a second type of reaction called a delayed, an IgG4 reaction. And that happens a few hours up to four days later. We do a blood test and we test for both. Now, the interesting thing, when you go see a naturopath or chiropractor or alternative health provider, they're only able to order the IgG4, the delayed, because they're not MDs, so they can't do the, the um the immediate reactions. And then when you see an MD, they don't understand the delays. They don't care about the delays because they're just worried about what's, what could potentially kill you. But they do that and they only limit it to like eight things usually. So there's two, there's two systems that are trying to help the patient, but they're really missing the, the totality of like, hey, you need to look at every food that person's eating, whether it's an immediate or delayed reaction, plant, animal, vegetable, grain, or legume. To us, it doesn't matter. So where I differ from my plant-based colleagues is that sometimes my plant-based colleagues will say, just go plant-based and everything will be fine. That's it. Now, 80, 82% of the data will show, our clinical will show, everybody will show, people get better. How come it's not 100%? Because your body has the right to say, I don't like this, 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 even on this side of the aisle, right? So you can, and I get people all the time coming back with positive for kale or almond or, you know, avocado or something. It's a superfood. Oh my God, it's supposed to be so good for you. So, you know, all the phytochemicals or the power greens. Well, if they're eating those power greens, they're just getting more inflammation from an immune perspective. Now, how do we treat it? Once we figure out, there's two ways of treatment. Uh, number one is avoidance, <laughs> obviously, but number two is, is looking at how to desensitize the patient. So sometimes what we'll do is that we have a computer program and based on the scoring and based on the class, and this is where you have to understand foods, you have to understand classes and reactions of foods is that we rotate those foods on a certain basis, okay? Like every four days. Uh, in a systematic fashion, you can actually retrain that person's body to become more tolerant to the allergies. Some people will want to do something more, more, more specific, you know, say, oh, the rest, you know, this, this thing is too complicated for me. Can I just train my body quickly uh, easier? Well, then we do something called sublingual immunotherapies, allergy drops. And the allergy drops are given where we dose the antigens or what you're allergic to based on your blood testing. And it's given underneath the tongue as a, I don't have it with me right now, but a daily pump. Uh, it's going to look like a bottle like this. And people would give a sublingual drop. And that's the same stuff that we give a shot. So it's not a, it's not a homeopathic, it's not a tincture. It's just kind of, you know, following the American Academy of Otolaryngolic Allergy and, you know, the American Academy of, there's different protocols that we give. And we treat both inhalants and foods. So we treat food allergies. We also treat environmental allergies. So people are like, oh my God, instead of taking a Zyrtec or a Claritin or Allegra or, you know, histamine, you know, antihistamine, natural medications like quercetin or uh, other things like that, uh, we can actually train the body, desensitize it. And that's more of a scientific method you know, using, you know, immunotherapy, as we call it, sublingual immunotherapy. So there's two different ways we like, we can rotate it in the diet. If there's a few, if people have a lot of things and it's like, wow, we need to do that. Then we, uh, we do the uh, sublingual drops. More importantly, though, we want to look at anybody who has a lot of food sensitivities, then we have to look at looking at their microbiome because they usually have, on average, higher risk of having leaky gut or gut dysbiome dysfunctions. Uh, and, and once you get that fixed, interesting enough, their allergies or the sensitivities to the foods go down. So usually there's, there's something that the foods are coming in that leaks into the gut, triggers an inflammatory response systemically, and then you know not just locally, but systemically. And uh, we can actually improve their tolerance. So it's not just avoidance and, and you know tolerance uh, training, but it's also strengthening the body. Where's the first place where all this is going to go into? Your GI tract. So we definitely evaluate the GI tract microbiome. And if you strengthen that, even people who have severe IgE uh, um, reactions, their, their reactions will get lesser over time. If you were in charge of this country, how would you fix the food system? Wow. 
<laughs> I don't think they would they would choose me to run the country. <laughs> There's two strong lobby groups for that. Um, food is huge because you know it's it's as American as apple pie, right? And cheeseburgers and and hot dogs and and, and Philly cheesesteaks and, and so um, I don't think that would they would choose me for becoming the leader of the country. However, what I would do is this: you know, we are spending. You know, again, we spent four trillion dollars in healthcare. It was three point seven when I gave my lectures. It went up to four point zero one trillion in healthcare. This is not talking about COVID relief. We're just talking about just regular healthcare. And again, remember, we're 46 out of 48 industrial nations. So we got, we got even lower on the list uh, since a year uh, aside of COVID. Um, but what I would look at is, is um, you know, making higher quality food like produce cheap. Uh, and there's, I just read like just recently today that like in, in, in LA and near Compton, they're building this, uh, facility, 95,000 square foot facility of doing like what they call vertical growth of, you know, like, uh, produce, you know, like, you know, with, you know, hydroponic and, you know, all stuff. And they're going to be able to feed a lot of African-Americans in the community and just people in the community in general for a very, very low minimal cost. Right. So you don't have to go to like a whole foods or something really expensive. Uh, here in Albuquerque, we have our patients actually enroll in a, a community uh, sustainable agriculture, like a co-op and they, they, it brings the food to their door and, you know, you can pick what you want and you can check it online and, you know, everything's coming from different states co-ops. And so you can get, you know, fresh vegetables, uh, fruits and grains. Some people who eat animal protein, they even have clean source of that. But there's ways to get, you know, food shouldn't be so expensive. Uh, that that's healthy for you, but cheap food, which is abundant, is everywhere. And so I would flip the ratio. I would look at, you know, just like like recently we just passed a cannabis, cannabis legislation in New Mexico finally, um, and and how the state's looking at it's like okay, we're putting a 12% tax to 18% tax on cannabis plus our gross receipts tax plus the, so we get like 30% tax on that. But you know, it'll still then go back to different funds, right? Schools and infrastructure and roads and blah blah blah. So I would look at the same thing with fast food. I'd want to make the, the, the cheap food that causes the highest problem in our healthcare a little bit more expensive and the healthier foods cheaper. So just, just like tobacco and you know, alcohol, you know, I would tax the things that would call sin foods. And I think, you know, I'm not saying that people cannot have a cheeseburger or people cannot have this, but the problem is if you look at the relationship of eating those foods and what it costs us as a taxpayer, Remember, because corporations aren't paying taxes. The other thing, I'd, I'd be like making corporations pay taxes for that because they ain't paying their fair share. You and I are paying our fair share for people who are being unhealthy and they're being unhealthy, not purposefully. They're being unhealthy because they don't understand the ramifications of how the food is actually negatively impacting their health care. This is just how it's being driven. And if you read my book, I'll go into like 400 pages of 1500 studies showing you like the marketing aspects of like why people think, you know, grass fed is better or, or farm raised or, 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 or fresh, you know, uh, you know, wild caught is better or you know, how's what, what isn't chicken, white meat better? All that's just marketing, you know, and, and I'll go into the details of that. So people need to understand, like, they're not here. I said this before, but they're not here by default. Their disease is not there by default. It's by design. You know, we're not the, we're not the, 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 the most, the, the global econ number one leader in the economy in the world is us. And we're actually performing the worst, even with COVID deaths, right? So what is the mismatch? Something is wrong with what we're doing. And part of it, we have to look at the food. So I would go back and, and flip, flip the ratios. I need mean, people who are providing healthy food options, especially produce, fresh foods, make it the cheapest. I would subsidize those foods. I would make sure that, you know, and I wouldn't be sub giving subsidies to, to dairy farmers that make cheap pizzas that, you know, that's why you can get, you know, four for a dollar, blah, blah, delivered to your door. These are all like taxpayer funded companies that grow that don't pay taxes then feed back into the system. So I would flip the ratios. I'd make, I make all these uh, healthy restaurants, uh, healthy farmers uh, who are giving good food uh, subsidies and then flip the subsidies. Like, okay, all these ones that are getting subsidies that, that now they're just dumping dairy subsidies. They're just dumping. There's farms that just dump millions and millions of gallons of, cause it's like, if you don't make it, if you don't this, like they just dump it and they collect the, the, the government cash. We would want to change that. So I would, I would flip the ratio of, of really making sin foods, uh, a little bit higher cost and then making affordable foods or healthy foods more affordable so that um, people have access to that, right? Because right now, the, why they go to fast food? Because it's cheap, right? It's cheap, easy, and convenient. But that's just because we made it cheap, easy, and convenient. If you look at all the other industrial nations who eat healthy or just are having better health outcomes, right? remember the 46 countries above us who are really poor, right? Even, even you know, Turkey and Dominican Republic and Iran, who are the the three above us, by the way, right? And <laughs> they're really poor. Is that you have to look at? It, is that what are they eating? They're not wealthy countries because you know rice and beans is cheap. 
<laughs> certain foods are really you know inexpensive to to have a, a, a source of high protein high quality nutrition high quality fiber phytonutrients however you know when you get kale at a whole foods market that might be a little bit overpriced because it's just packaging and demonst- you know a display of product and that's a misnomer because people go well that's an urban trend that you know i can i live in the inner city i can't go to whole foods and get healthy it's like no you can get rice and beans you, anybody can get healthy you go to india you can look at how many healthy people are china they're not eating at Whole Foods. They're not eating, you know, these fancy markets or, or fancy, you know, restaurants. It's like, but we need to have more of this communicable link or community link from farm to table directly so that we're kind of cutting out middle people and just making food more uh, equitable and, and access better to most people. So vote for me. <laughs> How do you fix gastrointestinal issues? Do some whole plant based foods make gastrointestinal issues worse? What about gluten? How do you make sure you don't get celiac disease? All right. So a couple of things. How do we fix it? Number one is we test for it first. Um, we test the microbiome. We do the small intestinal up, uh, bacterial growth, which is the upper part of small intestine. It's a breath test. And we do a stool test, a colon test. The colon test will look at like your, your digestive enzymes. It'll look at your amount of protein and fats that you're absorbing, the amount of fiber that you're eating and are you absorbing. Are you able to detoxify or not? Is there inflammation in the bowel? Is there leaky gut? Is there overgrowth of, of upper or lower? Is there bacteria? Is there candida, mycology? Is there parasites? Okay. Uh, look, so that's kind of the functionality. How's your gut actually working, right? Not just diarrhea, constipation, and you know, people have a colonoscopy, endoscopy. That just tells us that is there a pathology or disease. We're looking at the function because even when they do the colonoscopy, just because someone has an issue doesn't mean they see it, right? They don't see digestion, absorption, assimilation. They just see bleeding, tumor, polyp, ulcer, stricture, hemorrhoid, whatever. So we want to look at the function of the gut. So we first look at that. Then we look at the foods. We look at, you know, are, do you have any food sensitivities that are triggering some kind of inflammatory response? Because we shift the patient to a plant-based diet, but we still want to make sure even in the plant world that they don't have any kind of food sensitivities. Now, once we flip that, that microbiome, everything gets better. Now, the, question, the second part of the question is asking, well, isn't certain foods might be aggravating the gut? Yes. So when people have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is very common now, right? Antibiotic use, you know, uh, even even this, the data is now showing just even foodborne illness. So one in four Americans get a foodborne illness every year, right? Go to a restaurant, go to a buffet, you know, go on a cruise, something get sick, right? Because something wasn't cooked, something washed their hands. Common, right? You don't have to travel outside the country anymore to have this issue. It's like you can go to your local you know, chain restaurant, you know, and get that problem. So what we have to look at is. Um, when the gut microbiome is dysfunctional, then we can get these overgrowths. Now, when they have these overgrowths, right, of bacteria or these other things, then certain foods actually do aggravate it, right? So then there was this whole concept of FODMAPs diets and all these kind of SIBO diets, right? So they were reducing the foods that aggravate and cause gas, right? So these were foods that were um, fermented beans, le- you know, legumes, broccoli, all these kind of things. So people would restrict that. The doctors created this diet. Like here are the things that kind of cause those symptoms. And if you had those symptoms, you don't eat those foods, you'd feel better. So everybody felt better following these diets. The problem is those are not diets that are healing the gut. They're just treating your symptoms again, right? So, so, so the idea is that the best foods that are actually going to help prevent that overgrowth again, and that's going to keep your microbiome actually in balance, from getting those kind of things are the foods that actually aggravate in the beginning. So in the beginning, sometimes I'm like, okay, you can avoid some of those foods first while we fix, because if they have leaky gut, if they have an overgrowth, if, then we have certain protocols that we have to give to fix that. Then once that's fixed, they have to be eating those foods to strengthen their gut, so therefore they don't become the chronic relapsing patient. The problem is most doctors end up having these chronically relapsing patients. There's clinics that treat you know, gut dysbiosis and SIBO doctors and blah, blah, and they see patients over and over and over and over again and the reason why they're saying over it because they're not telling them how to change their diet to actually reform, rejuvenate, and restore that function. So they just make money on this side. Now, it doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong. They're treating the gut correctly, but where they're limiting in their expertise and understanding of the microbiome and nutrition is how do we fix it? Again, not just manage it or just treat it. And it's kind of like the question before, how do you get rid of candy? You know, it's like, it's, it's not that simple. Microbiome can be thrown off, viral infection or you know, stress, or I, you know, I got the flu or I got COVID. Now my gut's off. What can we do? We have to always assess it you know, determine what, what we need to do to rebalance it, but we still always have to strengthen it, not just like treat it all the time. So furthering that point, what are the most important things we can do to rebuild our gut microbiome? What supplements should we take for it? So it all depends on where you're at in the stage, 
right? So for example, this is the mistake that most people will do. If they have a bacterial overgrowth, like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and they take probiotics or prebiotics, they get worse. <laughs> so people are like, oh, you know, like, and then take more. Like, that's not necessarily good. Okay. So a lot of times we have to we have to get control of the overgrowth or the imbalance before we replenish with probiotics. But again, you know, the problem with probiotics, like we give, I give example, we give, uh, we have a complete probiotic formula, pills and powders. We've been doing this for a long time, and we're really, you know, I'm kind of people like, oh, you, Dr. Pai, you're so like obsessive compulsive on probiotics, because you know we have to en ensure the potency, purity, safety, and efficacy. Now. 10% of all probiotics on the market are, are in the bottle by the time you take it. So if you say something that says 1 billion or 10 billion or 50 billion, it's 10% of that amount that's actually in there at the time that they actually take it. And when we, what we do with ours is that we actually look at stability testing. We look at temperature, humidity, and time. So ours is like a year after the expiration date at room temperature, it will have what it has in the bottle on the bottle. So, that's, so there's a little bit of like, because when we give probiotics, we have to make sure that they're, we're doing, I'm delivering it as a, you know, a treatment of restoring your function. It's not just as, as a willy nilly, I'll just take it because I said that. Now, I'll give you another thing. Just, just Amazon recently, they just put a new rule out for sellers. So from April to October, if their product cannot hit 178 degrees Fahrenheit and it's not stable, they don't want, they will get, they're going to pull it off Amazon coming now because too many things are now being, so that means like, but 90% of people buy their probiotics from Amazon, right? Because on a truck, it's like, remember, like they're guaranteeing up, so it was 10% before this thing. But what happens is showing us that shipping and trucking and warehouses are a lot hotter than we expect it to be. And so a lot of times that even people who are buying even a good product, maybe on Amazon, is still not getting it because of how it's being handled, right? So this is a problem for, you know, even produce, they could look at it for produce and all sorts of foods, even drugs, people buying, you know, medications like, well, does my medication do well in the heat? So going back to the gut, so probiotics, then there's prebiotics, then there's spore biotics. These are specific probiotics that go into the gut. They work for about two weeks and they help provide energy and nutrients for the other, other, other microbes. Eating fermented foods can be very helpful as well. I'm not, you, don't, you can't just replenish everything with fermented foods like drinking kombucha, but those things are not necessarily bad for you. I don't think that they're, they're, they're necessarily needed, but eating fermented foods like kimchi or sauerkraut definitely are important if people like to do that. Um, but replenishing the probiotics are important. And so taking the right kind, there's certain kinds uh, like Saccharomyces boulardii that we give if people have diarrhea or candida issues. I mean, there's now, you know, there's only 50, 60 species available. We even have interesting, we have a probiotic that comes out of Europe that um, the clinical studies show for depression, uh, mood disorders, and anxiety. I even have a patient has schizophrenia. And after we fixed his gut from leaky gut, we looked at his food allergies and giving him, so I'm not touching any of his anti- schizophrenic medications, which are very strong, by the way, he's now coming in, he's talking, he's having a normal discussion. Now he's still schizophrenic, mind you, right? But his affect and his ability to, to communicate is different because it's all the microbiome, this is all the neurotransmitters that are happening in our gut that are not necessarily in our brain. So we're very specific when we give probiotics. It's not just like, oh, just take something. Oh, I take, you know, this, the, the GI doctor says, take this product at Walgreens has 1 billion of one species. Good luck. Now you have basically 100 million and good luck that it's now there even less of that. So there's a lot of things that are, are kind of meant to fail. They're not harmful, but they don't really get you over the hump. So the system is like, well, I still got to take these, these 10 other GI medications or I still got to, it doesn't really help cure my disease or heal my disease. And so the idea is that when we use probiotics and, and gut products, even for leaky gut, what kind of ingredients? So when we look at immunoglobulins, for example, which we use now, 5% of people can have problems with immunoglobulins. So we can monitor that. Uh, you know, they can get diarrhea, for example. But you know, if someone just types in an IgG powder on Amazon or, or online, you'll see that it comes with 20 grams of some kind of whey, casein, or dairy protein, which is pro-inflammatory. So we have to look at you know, getting the immunoglobulins that come from the serum, that come from companies that have done clinical studies, and make sure that it's 100% zero dairy, zero whey, zero Because we're using it not as a nutritional supplement. We're looking at a lowering inflammation for people who have colitis or inflammatory bowel disease. That's what the studies are showing it to be used for. So certain things that we are very specific at, but the problem is a lot of people, they just listen to something online and they kind of take this and they kind of jump around, not understanding that some things can aggravate an overgrowth. Some things can actually aggravate their system. There's also levels of like um, strategy in terms of how to do it. So if I come and someone has SIBO, they have gut dysbiosis, they have food allergies, they have leaky gut, and they have some kind of metal problem. And I had one person the other day, just last week, and he had like that plus two other things, which is rare, by the way. Okay, it's rare. Not everybody's going to have it. But it's like when someone comes with that much dysfunction, 
then you have to understand there's a clinical expertise of guidance has to be given up. What do you do first? Certain things, if you do too fast, it actually will make it worse. So people are like, I need a heavy metal detox now. No, that's my last thing I'm doing because I can actually have it go out and come back right back in and actually implant or actually cause more of a, a severe reaction of, of the removal. So there's a little bit of like understanding, like a lot of people want to do everything at once. A lot of people are health coaches online. Everybody's like, oh, just do this, take this whole product regimen. That's, that's misinformation. So when we look at the gut, the gut is really important and you need to have someone who has the expertise on understanding microbiome, nutrition, and inflammation. And that's what we can offer. One thing I like uh, the people watching is that we do consultations worldwide. So we do everything by Zoom. We send the testing kits and, you know, uh, Anyways, so they don't have to necessarily physically come here. We just provide the, the education and advice uh, from afar. Why was it important for you to come back here and speak at the Real Truth About Health Conference? Why is because there's more inflammation now <laughs> than ever. Uh, since, you know, and the interesting thing is, as I fit, you know, last year when I came, I spoke and then I had to immediately leave. Uh, I didn't get to spend the whole week. So I only got to spend like three to the first three days. And then, unfortunately, because there was a lot of wonderful speakers that I, that I know really well who are on the panel, who are plant based, and, you know, who are just, you know, they've done the studies and, you know, they're, they're my heroes and, and colleagues I really uh, admire and appreciate. Uh, but the interesting thing is when I left and I was sitting in the airport, you know, that was the time that COVID was just hitting on the news. And I was actually sitting in the, I forget, is it LaGuardia or whatever the New York airport is, that I was there close to whatever the conference was. And all these people started coming off the plane with masks, <laughs> you know, and we, did, you know, we're just sitting there watching, you know, CNN or whatever was on the TV. And it was like, you know, breaking news, this thing is coming. And we're like, we didn't know what was happening. <laughs> like, what's going on? There's a huge shift of, of how we understand inflammation. So my whole, uh, and why I was appreciative of being invited back was not just talking about diet, because by the time everybody listens to everybody, everybody knows that we should be eating a plant-based diet. But what I'm going to focus on is really about what can you do, not only in addition to the diet, you know, getting specifics now, because, you know, people talk about supplements, missing bad, good and bad. Like, I want to get to details. Like, these are the specific things that you should be looking for on a bottle and a product on a potency. Uh, I know that I, I'm plant-based first. So obviously, you know, supplement, supplement the diet, then it'll replace the diet. But it's key to understand because, you know, we still can have problems even if you're plant-based. You can still have a bad day. You can still have stress. You can still have, you know, a, a low immune system function. You can still not exercise as much. There's other things that can throw your life off aside of eating healthy. And so there's, there's things that we want to add to make sure that we're giving people an optimum benefit to having an optimum outcome of health. Well, we are very grateful, <clears throat> excuse me, we're very grateful that you've come back and uh, to join us again and uh, for being so gracious with your time. And uh, with that, is there anything else you want to add before we go? No, just so uh, you can come, you know, if anybody's interested, you can go to sanjevany.net. That's www.sanjevany, spelled S-A-N-J-E-V-A-N-I. That's S-A-N-J-E-V-A-N-I.net. And also you can go to our Sanjevany store, Sanjevany, S-A-N-J-E-V-A-N-I store, S-T-O-R.com to look at our wonderful products and stuff like that. I do have a book, An Inflammation Nation. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on, on uh, iTunes. You can get it on Audible uh, and inflammationnation.com. And you can get a signed copy from me. Uh, and and you can look at bossmeric.com, B-O-S-M-E-R-I-C.com for understanding a little bit more of the anti-inflammatory that I'll be speaking about at the conference. Wonderful. Dr. Pai, thank you so much. Good to see you again. Thank you. Nice, and, nice uh, seeing you again. Likewise, be well. All right, be well. Stay safe. Thank you.